Dogs, swab the decks and hoist the sails. The guns on board be neat and some proper manum. Pieces of eight and a fine wench on your arm. If you work, be not too shoddy. Be careful not to flounder too badly, though, or you may have to dance the hemp and jig. As we see you to Davy Jones, the Jeffy, my boy. On with the show. Well, shiver me timbers. To our listeners from across all regions of the planet, welcome once again aboard the Robin Hood, flagship to the world's one and only cooperatively inspired charity podcast network, WPRPN. Live streaming from under some of South Korea's most heavily sprayed early December hazy winter skies. You're listening to episode 132 of Pirate Radio Podcasts. I'm your host, as always, the ship's chief communications officer, Jaffe Ryder. Pre-recorded on a day which will forever live in infamy, we're joined this week by host and guiding light of Forum Borealis, LB, a.k.a. Alvin Zen. A.K.A. El Borealis. Forum Borealis is a paradigm-expanding podcast exploring controversial, marginalized, innovative, obscure, anomalous, and system-critical topics within history, culture, philosophy, science, and politics. Through in-depth conversations with the most interesting authors, scholars, researchers, and free thinkers of the age. Al B., can you believe it? Uh, Actually, we have managed to reconnect here after a number of months. March was the last time you were back visiting us here. Great that you managed to make it and have uh, dropped by this week. Thank you very much, and uh, Val Hill sits put on immediately a signal dog. That's for all the Norwegians in the audience, is it? <laughs> and Scandinavians, I guess. Well, you know, we actually have a new Scandinavian friend. Uh, I call her, a, she's a Valkyrie of sorts in my eyes. Uh, when I see her, I can't help but think Valkyrie. So, uh, Kate Thorvaldsen, I believe is how you pronounce her last <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you've heard of her. Her last or not. name is after the god Thor. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Typical Norwegian name. In fact, Kate Thorvaldsen. Sounds very familiar. Well, we're hoping that we can get the two of you in touch with one another, just showing you how small a world it really is. In fact, I uh, do have a friend on Facebook called Kate Thorvaldsen. Let me see. She looks like a New Ager. Could that be her? Theoretical I don't know if you want to put it author and multi-artist, or speaker, I don't know. So tell me about your Kate. Well, you'd have to maybe send me the link to her Facebook profile, and I'll take a look. She's blonde, right? Think... Classical yeah. blonde? Sure, of course, yeah. No, uh, it's not of course. Everybody thinks all Norwegians are blonde. It's not true. No? The blondest people in Norway, you'll find them in the south, all the way to the south. You would think the further north, right? But no. All the way in the south, that's where probably 50% are blown. Otherwise, it's more like 25%. Maybe my definition of blonde is different from yours, because when I'm in, uh, let's say, uh, Mediterranean, Spain, Greece, Turkey, when they say blonde people, I say, oh, light uh, brown. (laughs) You know what I mean? So everything is relative, whatever. But uh, go on. Sorry, I hijacked your intro there. So there's blonde and there's a what mix of other red-haired, I suppose, in some cases, brown and maybe even a little bit of black as well mixed in from time to time. Yeah, have you seen the series uh, Vikings? You know, I've been wanting to download that one, actually. I guess you're recommending 
it's an okay show for the dramaturgy, for the entertainment, okay? That's okay. You won't be bored. Especially the first seasons were, were okay. Another good thing they do is that they do take some upgraded knowledge, but they still maintain the dumb down cliche about, okay, they don't portray Vikings with horn on their helmets, okay? At least that they don't do anymore. That's bullshit. They never had. That's the Teutonics. But they portray us like primitive, stupid idiots who didn't even know they were Englishmen until we stumbled onto a boat and found England, okay? So it's not a very good series in that terms. And they have very few Scandinavian actors, that said too. But they do a very good job in portraying how people in Scandinavia actually look. I don't know how they manage that, but they have that whole range of looks, which is pretty, pretty authentic, I think. So the first uh, episodes I saw, I thought they had used Norwegian actors, but uh, of course they didn't. Basically Irish and English. No overly politically correct approach to the casting in the sense of, well, let's throw, uh, we got to throw a few more blacks in there and uh, <laughs> people black, from yeah. uh, uh, well, South if America. Well, they have, uh, no, they do have uh, all sorts of ethnicity, but it's genuinely portrayed because when the Vikings go to, let's say, North Africa, they encounter black people, Arabian people, stuff like that. Yeah, then they use those actors, right? Of course. Uh, it would be ludicrous to, you know, use an Eskimo or a Norwegian to portray a Bedouin, for example. So <laughs> they have to stick to, you know, trying to be authentic. There's so much bullshit on air, so compared to other stuff, this is okay, I guess. It's just that don't imagine that how they portray culture and stuff back then is authentic, because it's not. You're absolutely right. That's a big mistake a lot of people make in thinking that everything brought to us by Hollywood must necessarily be the way it was in the past down through history. It really gets, that's a, a real pet peeve of mine for sure. I, I don't know. I'm not really in a position to educate others, but. I can at least speak out and say something about it and pointing out that, hey, you might want to just kind of put the brakes on that and think about this a little more because the way that so many of us have been dumbed down and uh, I'm not sure if you'd say robbed of our critical thinking skills necessarily so much as just not bothering to uh, care. Maybe it's a little too much of the fluoridation of the water or something mm. along those lines, but uh, the pineal gland, which I think you're a bit of a, a student mm. of that area of, of study and so forth. We could get going down that avenue uh, at some point here. I'm sure that I'm have to make a side note, the pineal gland, but one of the well, things... Well, my we... pineal gland can't help mm. me today. <laughs> well, you just got in. Hang on, I have to warn everyone listening. Uh, uh, if they listened last time... I sounded like a runaway uh, train, right? Amphetamine or something. Today is going to be the opposite because I'm dead tired. I actually drank yesterday. If it sounds like a big deal, it's because it is. I drink maybe once every half year. So uh, I'm a bit slow today. When did I come home? You see, this is what happens when I'm tired. I'm leaving mm -hmm. tomorrow and I'm coming back on Friday. When you are airing this, so I'm going to check in then. That's right. Just to remind people, of course, this is a pre-recorded conversation with host of Forum Borealis, Svalbard-based resident Al B, a.k.a. Alvin Zen. I mispronounced it and mangled it all to hell last time when I was talking to Kate, too, just a couple of weeks ago. She's like, what are you trying to say? So, uh, Svalbard. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> you want to hear how, how we say it? it? Yeah. Svalbard. Svalbard, Svalbard. No, no, Svalbard. You, you, you're Americans. You say ah, ah. We say ah, oh, ah. Oh. Can you Svalbard. hear the difference? Svalbard. No, yeah. no, I can't. Yeah. No, you got it. No, better. You got it. Svalbard. Okay, yep. better. So Kate uh, is, is is like a person you've interviewed. Is that it? Well, it's a friend of a uh, friend of a friend's and someone we have talked to. I helped a co-anchor a show just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Tommy Shutter who actually moonlights as our web tech on the side, also has his own live streaming project on the go. And we've actually brought your name up in the nice. context of things as well, too. So just in the sense of it would be interesting to maybe 
introduce you to Cade and uh, maybe have you even just as a guest on Tommy's show because he's all about positivity and spiritual uh, awakening, let's say. Yeah, you know why I'm game for being interviewed? I think it's very easy to be overexposed, but I got scolded for my team because I, we do nothing to promote our shows. They said, why don't you just go uh, accept, because I declined all interviews. I think yours were the first one I did, wasn't it? Rune Soup was the first, as I recall. Oh, he beat you to it, but you're the first who booked me, and I say yes to you. Your interview cherry was stolen by Rune Soup. Yeah, <laughs> pirates at, uh, <laughs> Shit scored dare I profile. say, sloppy Scandinavian seconds with, uh, with Alf <laughs> or Borealis. And, no, uh, no, no I'm, I'm still fresh. But, you know, uh, Alex in Skeptico, he, he realized that too. He's clever. So what he did, he thought, ah, oh, damn, the freshness is, is taken by the others, right? So what he did was that he bought me a friggin' webcam, and then I was obliged to use it with him, right? I saw the so, interview. That's right. Yeah, yeah, so that's the first on air. But, and the same thing then as today. I was damn tired and slow. Uh, then he had a follow-up. And that's, that, then, then I was back to speed. Break that down. What, what exactly happened there then? Well, the second part is really what's worth listening to, although maybe the first part is okay as a context. The second part, we went into the deep end. He, you know, Alex, he's never shy. He pushes his guests. He want to go everywhere. So he brought us into all the hot topics he wanted to discuss, like, classical for him, though, uh, UFOs, what they are, blah, 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 deep state, everything. He wanted my take on all that stuff. And and we, we deliberately tried to, because we've talked a lot, and I've had him on twice there, too. So we know where we stand. So we agree about everything, right? So we we, uh, we thought, okay, let's see if we can find some disagreement. And, and we could. We did. This is, of course, Alex Sakatis, I believe is how his last name is pronounced, host of Skeptico. Great podcast out there on the interwebs. You can access his shows via iTunes. Are your shows available via iTunes? Not as of yet. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to... Personally, I, I despise Apple, but I realize we need to be on the, in the podcast world, and we need to get on Minds and probably bitch it. So my aim for 2019 is to start uh, uploading on those places. But you tell me now. Uh, I bet some of my listeners, they will probably not be uh, listening into the live show, but they will be listening into the YouTube version of this. So just take the opportunity to educate me on your excellent shows. I've only reached them through YouTube. How is it that people can reach you? Where are you broadcasting? I'm physically situated off of the Korean Peninsula. and Yeah, but I mean, uh, where, where can people find you? Where are you broadcasting live? We live stream off of YouTube. We're trying to change that, but unfortunately, as uh, try as we might, we're just not able to find anything better at the present moment, including, and I should say, especially the fact that, you know, the big thing when we do put the live streams out over YouTube, it's all about the live human interaction people logged into google and their accounts there of course they can uh, engage us through the chat that's a that's a big deal for us we really get a kick out of that it helps to kind of steer the show along as well as just give us some some sense of direction in some cases at least but also just a sense that people are out there listening and they're willing to engage with most people actually it really depends on the numbers that we have dropping by you have an, a, a really amazing following. You're actually one of our top guests as far as the people that are behind you. Last time around with what we put together, uh, we had 30 people in the, the live YouTube chat, even though as with this case, same kind of deal, unfortunately, just because of scheduling issues, you had tried to make it and well, together we did to coordinate things so that we could do it in the regular slot, you're going to be able to join us in the after show this go round, hopefully, as it is once again, pre-recorded affair. And uh, hopefully maybe we'll try to at least meet that same mark of 30 people or so via YouTube who are uh, followers of yours and are interested in dropping by and 
taking part in what it is we have to offer. A lot of that comes down to the way that you've managed to master perhaps your social media skills with the networks that you've uh, infiltrated. You too much credit, man. I think it's it's more of a to do with the fact that, uh, like you, I'm anonymous, semi-anonymous at least. I've shown my face, but what does that face mean? I did have that anonymous mask on, but, you know, the fake nose, the fake uh, beard. But uh, I think it's the curiosity factor, you know. If you don't overexpose yourself, people get hungry. People want to know. You know the Freemasons, right? They oh, wouldn't yeah, have course. all those members <laughs> if they were not having this atmosphere of you can't be a member. <laughs> we pick the members. In real life, that's not true. You can become a Mason if you apply. But people think it's exclusive. That's why they want to join. That's a psychological principle. So if you overexpose yourself, you're not going to be that interesting, right? And I'm not saying this isn't deliberate on my part. I just discover that's the effect. I have personal reasons not to want to, you know, smear my name all over the Internet. So uh, I think that's more to do with it. I, I hope I'm not overexposed by today so that you can get beat them to it. It's also about how to reach them. So I today I will uh, advertise this show uh, for my people. So hopefully some of them will be listening right now. And also, I've never done live, I think. No, I haven't. So that means that if anyone has any questions for me or whatever, that will be a news thing, right? That will be fresh. So uh, if I can uh, join you in the after show, I'll be happy to interact with your audience. Yeah, we're looking forward to it, hoping that we're going to be able to make that all come together. Obviously, you're just... You're going to be out on the road just working on making your way back home. Once again, I guess you've got a yet another a family obligation of sorts. That's sort. what's going on, um, I guess I should say, today, because technically it will be today when people listen, yeah. No, Any details you can provide us? or is it... No, I'm just going to help uh, a family member. First I have to take the train, uh, and then I have to take a plane. So that's why I, I couldn't make it back, because you're eight hours ahead of me, man. If you were, like, in Australia, we would make it, but no. You know, it's interesting, too, just speaking of time schedules and synchronicity and so forth, that uh, last go-round, I'm not sure if you recall or not, but it, it was actually the spring equinox. Yeah. Uh, well, now it's the, the winter solstice, right? <laughs> well, m we're working on it here, but uh, more than that, it's actually December 7th, this go round, which, as I recall, was uh, is a day that forever will live in infamy, following the uh, 1941 Pearl Harbor attacks in Hawaii, oh, right. right? December right. 7th. So, December 8th, just off the top of my head, being the day that actually John Lennon was shot as well, too. So that's something which. Each and every year, I myself stop to... That's what I thought you were going to say when you were commemorating the day today. But that's yeah. tomorrow then. Yeah, okay. What's up with this? Why are every, every one of these lone lunatic killers reading To Kill a Mockingbird? What's up with that? You're close. It's actually uh, J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Oh, that's it. Sorry. Yeah, Do you're right. You're, yeah, really you're right. on the right track there. So, yeah, well, hey, you tell me. So, you know, it's interesting, uh, now that you brought it up, though, some people have actually, what is the word, deconstructed the book. And Salinger only passed away a couple of years ago. He's a former World War II vet, I think ended up living up into his 90s or so. But somebody who just kicked the bucket quite recently, a very prominent, well-known name, easily recognizable, is who they figured this one I can't exactly recall who it was. I could easily track it down, though. Speaking of high-profile personalities and the like and overexposure, he's somebody who's out there quite a lot in the mainstream of the alternative, you know, social media and the like. Joseph, no, it's not Joseph Farrell, who I know has been on your show a uh, time or two now, and you've done some great, we should get into your... The, he lives in my studio. I, I set up a... Uh, break. How about that? Yeah, that would be something. Him. But we'll have to turn the focus back to the shows that you've done with all these various characters and personalities today. Peter Lavenda, there's another 
you know, really well known name as well too, of course. Yeah, yeah, but but finish your thought. Which you Joe said. Yeah, I know. First? I tend yeah. to skip around a little bit and sometimes just leave things hanging there, just uh, flapping in the wind and getting lost in the breeze. But George, yeah, I, I prefer those kind of conversations anyway. But let's 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 just for the listeners' sake. Socratic <laughs> method. Keep that thought. Circle back. <laughs> what? Finish what you're going yeah, to say. Exactly. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the kind of preppy Ivy League school character that uh, Holden Caulfield in Catcher on the Rye, he's the protagonist, was constantly uh, referencing, uh, I can't give you a, a real expert sort of, you know, the breakdown of things, basically, but Atwill, that was his guy, I think the guy who is his Messiah, oh, yeah. so Atwell. he's the guy that I think put this together, dealing with Catcher on the Rye and so forth, but the character turned out to be, it was George H.W. Bush, is who he suspected was this person who, we just got rid of him. at that time, all those years ago, believe it or not, Salinger actually knew during his university days. It's interesting talking about Bush. I'm just looking at a picture of him right now and the skull and bones, uh, his alumni picture there, his graduation. Hang on, are you talking about senior or, or junior? Senior. Obviously yeah. senior. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. but that was the character apparently that he was, I'd have to, uh, what I could do actually if I find it while we're doing this show. It's going to be coming out live, as we've mentioned now several times, this coming Friday night, our regular time slot. While we're doing it live, I'll shoot that link off into the chat box area and uh, to help, you know, if people want to follow that up and look into things a little more deeply, you can kind of uh, get hip, as it were, to what it is I'm trying to draw their attention to, basically, if you follow my drift. So, yeah, Holden Caulfield, Catching the Rye. Author J.D. Salinger just passed away a couple of years, and there was this mysterious unnamed. He never, he never was named, but he was always there. And Caulfield was kind of obsessing over him at various points, I guess, in the book. And you know, he he referred to them all as, uh, and that was one of the comments, I guess, that who, not Hinckley getting up my assassins mixed up now because Hinckley was the guy that tried to off Reagan, but uh, uh, Mark David Chapman. That was the comment that he made to John Lennon was, uh, I guess, he said something about phony. Hang on. No, the guy who tried to take down Reagan, I think he was a member of the Grey Wolf. He was a Turkish citizen, a fascist from No, Turkey. now you're thinking, now you're thinking. The, <laughs> oh, no, that's the Pope. That's Sorry. the Pope. I, I'm getting Pope. my assassins mixed up. It has but, you know, they all, they, all, <laughs> they all answer to one master, don't they? <laughs> they all serve the same... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, who, yeah, who's to really say? But no, uh, no, I think there's something to be said for this. So, as you say, why is it that it's the same book repeatedly over and over again? There's been some speculation that it's used as a kind of brainwashing manual. I, I think it may be like, have you seen the very, very excellent, and, and I talked with uh, Alex Sakiris, uh, Skeptico, who, by the way, has had Joe Atwill on many times. That's how I know about Atwill. He pointed to the fact that, damn, I lost my thread. You see, that's what happens when I drank the rely. What was I going? Where were I going? What, what, was water, I, what were we light. talking about? Catcher in the Rye? Yeah. No, sorry. Jesus Messiah, Joseph Atwell, yeah. no, he, programming, brainwashing. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, you know, the very, very excellent magician, um, British magician called Darren Brown. You know Darren Brown? Oh, Darren Brown. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he absolutely. has demonstrated once and for all how this works. What they need, they need a trigger point. They need a trigger. Yep. And I think that book, for some reason, maybe they all are trained by the same CIA mind manipulation. I haven't actually read Joseph Farrell's latest book, but it's supposed to be brilliant. It's all about mind control. Hold it, hold it. Farrell or Atwell? You're the one who said Atwill had decoded this. Okay, That's okay. Uh, but uh, Farrell has written yep. a, yep. Yep. a yep. book on mind control. I, I don't know if this is mentioned there, but the thing is, uh, they probably have the same training program or something, because uh, why else? Or it's like an inside joke among these guys, mind control guys, uh, that they use this book, and then that becomes like the trigger. It's like a uh, marker or something. You know what I mean? I, I think that's why, because it's not like you become a murderer by reading that book. <laughs> that's not how it works. It's not like there are some invisible suggestions in that book. I, I think it's the opposite around. The book is a victim of these people. It's not that we become a victim of the book, you know what I mean? 
That's pretty deep, man. It's a pretty sophisticated analysis. While you were uh, basically unpacking that for our listeners, I managed to track down what it was we've been discussing, and we're pretty much on the right track here and uh, in the zone, as it were. So Joseph Atwill, Catcher in the Rye, Mind Control, bingo, and we will definitely be sharing that with our listeners this week. Show number, I guess it is 132 is what we're looking at here. So I'll have to get on top of that. You, you've been going since 2015? 16. 16. So many great shows came about that time period. Uh, Runesu, I discovered. I thought they had been going, you know, like skeptical forever. But no, they too are a child of 15, 16. Well, and we're all part of the digital underground, too. Even you, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, you could look at it either way, I suppose. Oh, fortunately, but definitely. I just stumbled across, actually, your channel one day, and people did ask me, well, how did you meet up with this guy? And I was just surfing around and had been checking out your show archives, and I thought, geez, this guys he's got some good guests, and he's uh, he's a decent host, and thought we'd reach out to you. That has to be providence, because, I mean, what's the chances of you stumbling by our show? We do no advertisement. It's very obscure. Right. It's only word of mouth, and you weren't even told by anyone, right? No. So I when you so. stumbled over it, that has to be providence. Well, here's the thing. I Yeah, and I was listening to your shows for a while, too. You know, so I, I archived them. I put them in a folder, as I do when I kind of obsess on certain things, like, geez, I got to check out this and brush up and get up to speed on these talking points and, you know, what is being discussed here and so forth. So, yeah, fate, providence, and it was just, I give you all the credit in the world. You know, we really tip of the pirate hat. Oh, thank you, man. Mr. Al Borealis there for uh, getting back to us and saying, sure, I'll come on your show. In fact, I had so much fun the first time around. We'll we'll drop in for an encore, maybe six or seven months down the road. So, yeah, <laughs> sure. And I'll have you on, just so your listeners know. Uh, let's check in in spring, a few months from now. Hopefully, we'll promote pirate podcasts even more then. And also, send my regards to your friend that you mentioned, the guy with the spiritual show or whatever. If he wants me on, sure. Yeah, Tommy Schaefer, A.K. A uh, Tommy Shutter, aka Miami Tom, out there in, uh, in the great, uh, I guess they call it the Sunshine State, Florida, uh, USA. So, your your Florida is our Spain. You know how New Yorker retired to Florida, Norwegians retired to Spain. Newlyweds and the nearly dads. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well put. As a little slogan that I first came across back in my university days. So we did, once again, manage to track down the link to what it was we were looking for. A uh, fascinating theory on the part of Atwill as to this one character that he had referenced that uh, Holden Caulfield was obsessing over, whether in fact this could be actually George H.W. Bush, because he was seen as the big man on campus. You know how some people are with their university lives. They really very outgoing and they really like to be seen as it were and maintain a high level of, of visibility and uh, social engagement and activity. Yeah. Cause he was, he was born like, just like his son. He was born with a golden spoon up his ass. So uh, it was made for him, you know, like you said, skull and bones, everything from day one. So his career in CIA was a given. But Alex, did you listen to my show with Alex? He he said some very interesting things about Obama. Well, let's hear it. Oh, but wait a minute. First, I had Alex on for an official show. But then he called me one day and it was a private chat. We weren't supposed to put that out there. And we recorded. I think that's where we've gone the deepest ever. That's been my goal with my shows, has been to just put on the mic and do what you've been doing your whole life, have an interesting discussion with an interesting person, and go to the interesting places, and just record it so others can enjoy it too, not just me, right? That was my goal with my shows. And lo and behold, it actually happened literally with Alex, because we were talking and we were recording it. Not deliberately, I think it was just automatically on, like it is when we do these things. 
the software, whatever works. So we when we realized it was on after having chatted for a couple of hours, we thought, man, maybe we should share this. I must admit I edited out maybe five minutes, but all the other stuff I put out for my members or website subscribers is what we call it. It's not really members. So the, I have a couple of hours with Alex that is not on YouTube. It's only for those who are a member of our website. And there he told me something very interesting about Obama, about Obama's CIA past, how he was groomed for CIA. Yeah, there's some speculation he, in fact, uh, visited Russia. Well, this is evidence-based. Uh, there's talk of him visiting Russia years ago, as well as even there's those out there who take it a step further and make the claim that he is... Uh, he's been to Mars, you know, and all part of the secret space program and so forth. Yeah, that's what I thought Alex was going to talk about. That's where I think this info comes in. Of course, you can't have a real thing without having a bullshit thing piggybacking on it. That's how they do it these days. They don't just kill off people who talk. They contaminate the information with bullshit. And even if it was true that Obama has been on Mars or whatever, you know... 99.9% will dismiss it. But 99.9% won't necessarily dismiss a very sober thing uh, like Obama's grandparents being actually in CIA. Uh, that's his mother's parents, right? And the scandal of, you know, she was, a, long story short, she was a rebel and to get back at her parents, she hooked up with this African and because they were moving all the time and she was bored and you know how teenage girls are, right? Or boys for that matter. Then they had, to, oh shit, how are we going to fix this and blah, blah, blah. Long story short, he seems to have been groomed by CIA from day one. And uh, there's uh, maybe maybe this information comes from Atwill because I know that Atwill has been a guest at Alex's show many times. But this is pretty down to earth. It doesn't involve time travel or UFOs or anything like that. So I can believe that. I won't be surprised if Obama is on the payroll. Right. Well, uh, another story, too, which uh, I was more or less uh, aware of years ago, even before him winning office, was his, uh, I'm not sure if this is what you're getting at ultimately, but his uh, gay crack cocaine scandal with uh, a Sinclair, Larry Sinclair, out of, I think it was Chicago, during his time as a congressman. So, oh, no, and that just, that. The, you know, the media, big media just completely ignored that, uh, just as if it was a total, not just a non-issue, just as if it never happened. Obviously. But a Sinclair character. I'll tell you, the only, the only precedent where the media actually wants to dig up dirt is Trump. And I'm not a Trump supporter. Trump is rimming Israel and Saudi Arabia, so I have no sympathy there. But that said, it is true that he's not protected in the same way. The only way they would protect Trump is if he does something that aligns with the agenda of the powers that be, like, you know, this insane war in Yemen that he's continuing. Anything to uh, further the deep state's agenda, then there he's protected. They won't criticize him on this. But if they can find something personal on him, or better yet, if they can find some scandal involving Russia, oh my God, they'll, they'll give their right hand for that. But, you know, Trump, before he became a president, all his scandals were known. <laughs> we, know, we knew he was a con man. We knew he was a dirtbag. We knew he didn't give a damn about any other than himself. And people loved also how he um, hated many of his fellow oligarchs. Uh, other than that, they will protect them. Uh, I guess maybe if JFK had been around today, he would be under siege. I think JFK is the last president we've had, you've had, but I can't say we, because America basically rules the world. Uh, he's the last president that really was a man of the people in that, I mean, yes, he was an upper class guy and all that, but as far as his agenda went, he wanted to, you know, better the world. He wanted to do something for the people, not just for the oligarchs. Yeah, there's no doubt about the utterly ridiculous, constant and excessive over the top bias and spin that the Mockingbird media, it's just thoroughly CIA infested. That's a plants. Mockingbird we should kill, huh? Oh, jeez. 
It's well, <laughs> kill with the remote control. It's like, sorry, I'm voting with my remote control, and uh, you know, we have in this household here, uh, on this on this the ship that we sail with here out on the high digital seas, have not tuned in to any one of their lousy programs via television in the past. 10 years approximately. But uh, with respect to Trump, the one thing I will say, besides the way that the media is just so, because even the first year of office, historically, any president who uh, rose to power and would win an election and become yeah. head of state, tradition was to give him a year of grace, basically, where you give him a bit of slack and just kind of go easy on them, whoever they were. Not Trump. You can forget about that. Things have changed. So, you know, he's a major troll, obviously. And in that sense, I think he's great if he if he leaves people all discombobulated who uh, they're not able as one of our, you know, somebody who often drops by the show, Kaiser Chef, not able to put their big boy boots on, you know, or just find themselves so easily triggered by politically incorrect speech. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are really sick of political correctness. You're seeing that in places like, well, the pushback all over the world, frankly, Sweden now, even uh, France, of course, all hell breaking loose, maybe in a good way, though. Maybe that's what it needs. They need to kind of shake things up a little bit and say enough is enough. But just the last thing I'll say, though, about uh, uh, Trump and then turn things back yeah, over to yeah. you, our, our featured guest this week, Al Borealis, host of Forum Borealis, Pirate Radio podcast, episode number 132 is that Trump, they're trying now to pin this whole business of the, the Jeffrey Epstein, Lolita Express business, saying that he should be equally implicated along with uh, the likes of Bill Clinton and Alan Dushwich, as I like to refer to the guy. Not a fan. And we were talking about this just earlier today, the way that they trot this guy out. What a jerk. Oh, what a blowhard. A and and what a, just a total that. shill. On all the, I'm not sure about CNN if he's such a darling over there, but Fox, <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. sure I've seen him just numerous times. And, uh, I just, do you know how there's some people that, uh, maybe you don't have the same, uh, response, but there's some people where I, if I see him on TV, I just can't stand to watch them. My stomach starts to turn and I just cannot bear to, uh, keep my eyes on the screen and have to do something about it whichever way that is. But, yeah, uh, he's been thoroughly implicated, this Alan uh, Dushwich, and uh, Clinton as well, too. Even Stephen Hawking, the former very uh, world-famous uh, physicist who had been confined for all those years to his wheelchair. So uh, what are your thoughts, well, though? He's on been in scandals many times. He had a very drama with his wife. Hawking, huh? Yeah. Uh, some kind of sick uh, BDSM, um, uh, mental BDSM. Um, Wait a minute, she was she was abusive to him, wasn't she? Yep, yep, yep. I mean, how can he be abusive? Run her over with this uh, <laughs> wheelchair? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, what. I guess he needed some something to keep it interesting. If he's supposed to be a genius, it, it can be boring. Maybe I don't know. Poor guy, isn't he dead now? He passed away just uh, this past year or so. And under what circumstances? Let's rest in peace. Well, and who knows exactly under what circumstances. But the fact is, I guess he did outlive many of uh, what you know people had expected the mark that he would reach. So let him rest in peace. Just hopefully, as with the case of uh, recently now deceased Stan Lee, famous... Uh, Creator of yep. Spider-Man and many other superheroes, I think Iron Man. I'll tell you who will not re re let rest in peace, and that's uh, Papa Bush. Uh, he's a bastard, and I, on Twitter, I I wouldn't be twittering about it, but the, it was so much disgusting. You know how media is. When these war criminals die, for some reason we have to celebrate it. Don't rock the boat, keep the facade going. So I twittered good riddance and never forget his contribution to fucking up the world. Sorry, can we swear at this show? Yeah, you know, recent policy we've uh, actually implemented. You got one freebie, and after that, you're expected and required to contribute $10 or 10 doubloons, if you will, more kind of pirate parlance, uh, yeah. to the uh, pirate potty mouth tip jar. And, uh, oh, okay. Half of which goes towards charity, too, I, I should remind listeners. So, yes, indeed. There you go. There's your answer. That's fucking great. Oops, I owe you $10.
I guess you do. So you better pay yeah, up. Well, yeah, you'll we'll, get them. You'll get them. Operation Secret Santa. And that is something actually, you know, it's shifting gears. We'll probably, we'll jump around a little bit here too as well. But, uh, Operation Secret Santa, definitely something I like to talk about a little more in some detail, if only from the standpoint of how you had expressed an interest in learning more about yeah. what it was and perhaps even, uh, you know, keeping in touch. And that's kind of what actually uh, brought you back here at this particular date, as I recall. Yeah, I was supposed to be a Santa, wasn't I? Problem is, I'm going to Spain, so I'm going to be away for uh, until January. That's the pro that, That's why I think we ended up doing it today. Because originally you wanted me back for a secret Santa and then I couldn't make it and so we did it today instead. I think that's how it went down. But next year I'll, I'll be happy to if um, if you still want me. Absolutely. In the meantime, of course, uh, if you have the opportunity, uh, there's always the possibility of just doing what you can to help get the word out. I know you actually do. told us something a while ago about having some friends uh connected to the pirate bay uh, operation yeah well you were probing me about cred in that direction it was my it's actually a friend of my brother one of those three chaps are from my hometown bergen as you english people say bergen so but that's a tragic story you know just like every freedom fighter which reminds me i'm going to derail that now do you want to talk a little more about the secret santa you can take the conversation wherever you like, although now that you mentioned uh, Pirate Bay, that was okay. one of the areas, speaking of probing, we're hoping of just revisiting and getting clarification on you. you talked about it being a tragic story. What's the latest then? Uh, last I heard, uh, the gentleman who was essentially running the show had been, what is the word I'm looking for here now? There's a technical term, not retained. He uh, was... Uh, basically brought back from out of Thailand to Sweden? Yeah, that's the, not America? the guy who's my brother's friend. My brother, by the way, has birthday today. He's not, probably not listening, but I'll give him my regards anyway. He was the one who didn't deliver himself, so they hunted him down. Set an example, you know. It's re re ludicrous. It's never been more pirate baits out there or any other ways to share. But uh, they have to set an example, you know. Can't let the little man think he can stick his head out of the... Head above the parapet, as it's known, over the castle wall. Yeah, 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 something like that, yeah, yeah. So that's partly why populism is rising. And by the way, populism isn't just right-wing. It's not just alt-right going on today. It's populism across the board. And the interesting thing, uh, I discussed this a little with Alex too, because I'm so fed up about these wings, people identifying with a wing. If you do that, you're a moron, because that's exactly what the powers that be wants. They want you to identify either with uh, the left or with the right. And then they can set you up against each other. And, you know, it's the, it's the oldest playbook in the world. It's called divide and conquer, right? So interesting stuff going on before the Trump alt-right thing. There was people on the right, people on the left who were not corporate chips, who were populists, realized, geez, we have more things in common than we have uh, that divides us. Both of them are anti-establishment. Both of them want huge reforms on essential areas, like, say, anti-war, whatever, right? But then they take these identity politics issues, which are just bullshit. The media especially flounce that, so that, let's say, abortion, right? For or against, right? Oh, we have to hate each other. No, I'm going to vote based upon that. That's how they keep us in check. They keep us discussing identity political bullshit. That doesn't matter. Most uh, identity political issues are not decided by politicians. They are decided by generations, by zeitgeist, by contemporary culture. Take a thing like Mariana, right? Today, it's almost unthinkable, and everybody uses it across the board. Uh, there's no, it's not a wing thing. But that's decided by the people, and eventually it will become just like homosexuality. Nobody would ban homosexuality and throw uh, gay people in prison today. That's just because of the zeitgeist. It's not a politician who sat down and said, okay, let's clean this up. No, the politician follows when the culture is a pair. 
And that's what uh, we're seeing live happening with Mariana and every other identity political issue. But the real issues, like the bank screwing us over, stuff like that, that's not up for vote. And everybody hates, let's say money in politics, everybody hates it from left to right, the corruption, the corporate shifts. But we can't do anything about it because we split in these wings. And I'll give you a practical example. You know, uh, we've had a huge focus on our show on what you could call the classified space program. You know about that? You've heard so much. Oh, about- yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, secret space program. And Corey Good owns, owns uh, he's trademarked that whole idea and concept, has he not? Yeah, that's one of the reasons I don't say secret space programs. But yeah, Corey Good is another example of, I said they piggyback bullshit on real things, right? They have to do it. Then enter David Wilcox, Corey Good, stuff like that, because nobody will buy that story. Nobody. I mean, some will, of course. There's always cooks out there and naive people, but it's an effective way to get it away from the public. And I've just had, the show isn't out, as people are listening to this, it's not out. It's out for our website subscribers, but it's not out to the tube. But I had Michael Schratton, one of the leading researchers on the classified space program. Nothing to do with aliens, nothing to do with other stuff. It's just the evidence for the deep state or covert players, not just in the state, actually, more so in private contractors like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, all that stuff. It's just bam, 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 evidence, 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 evidence. When you listen to that show, you can't get away. You can't unlisten it. When you learn those facts, you know this classified space program there, and they're using our money, and they're using black money. Now, the black money, Catherine Fitz, former housing secretary under devil Bush Sr., has been in the forefront of nailing them on the money. Because you remember, nine, uh, not right before, day before 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld admitted, oh, 2.1 trillion, we can't account for it. It's worse. Now the number is up to, well, officially 21 trillion. But if you go all the way back to the housing bubble in, in the 80s, late 80s, uh, you're up to 50 trillion. These are money that, could finance several classified space programs. So it's not just going to that. It's going to, of course, maintaining security and all that stuff. But here's the thing. Speaking of those money has been taboo for so long. They try to crush Catherine Fitz. We have a program or two-part interview with her called This is the Black Economy. You'll hear her story. You'll hear her account for this. And she was deep in it, man. She was watching it unfolding in front of her eyes, how they're robbing. Ordinary people, they're robbing the state to finance stuff like that. People think it's going to coffers, some exotic coffers of the oligarchs. No, the oligarchs has more money than they can ever use, especially today when money is just a number in a computer. You're just printing it, right? Because they own also the printing press. They've hijacked that. Federal Reserve isn't more federal than any private bank. So here's the thing. It's $50 trillion and you're not supposed to talk about that. But then enter... A naive, progressive politician. You've heard about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? Sure. Yeah, and people probably think, oh, I don't identify with progressives, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but that's not the point. The point is, like I said, from the right to the left, you have genuine people who are not clued in on the establishment and the corporate things, and they want to reform. And you don't have to, you know, if we could get the corporate chills away, then we could have a honest discussion about how we should solve stuff. Should we go libertarian? Should we go progressive? Should we go nationalistic? Should we go socialist? All that stuff can be discussed and decided upon by the people. But you can't have that today because in both wings, the majority of politicians are on the payroll of the same master. But on both wings, you also have non-owned politicians. You know how the Tea Party brought in Lots of populist politicians, right? And the same is uh, going down with, you know, the Bernie faction on the left. So that's why they had to rob both Ron Paul and, and Bernie of their victories. But anyway, here's the point. Alexandria Cortez, she's a new politician. She's young and she's honest in that she want to fulfill her own reform to the system. So she did, she committed a few days ago on Twitter the huge crime of mentioning and, and she even understated it, the 21 trillion. She came over a good article on that. 
And she said, look, 21 trillion robbed from our coffers. It could finance, uh, what did she said? She, it could finance Medicare for all for 100 years. It could finance free college for everyone. But no, these money are supposed to go to war and to space program. Now, why am I mentioning this? Yeah, because she was, I've never seen an attack like this. She was attacked from all corners, all corners, from the conservatives to the liberals. Everybody had a field day with her making fun of her because you can't have someone bringing up that thing because as soon as you bring up that thing, it's a huge threat because if people start realizing that's what's going on, ordinary people, I don't care how redneck you are, if you realize that 21 trillion is robbed from you and you live in a shithole and your water is polluted and, and your salary is low and, you know, all that stuff, you're going to become a revolutionary. And that's what they couldn't have. So uh, she was... I mean, go on Twitter and look. All the replies on a thread is just bashing, bashing, bashing. Then Catherine Fitz, who is a conservative, came out to her defense and said, no, 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 these numbers are not just right, they're understated. If anyone wants to know the details, contact me. So uh, that's how it goes. And I think if uh, anybody knows about, who listens, knows about the classified space program and all that, you should go into that thread and try to balance some of the hate. I did. This is one of the rare, I think it's the first time I've ever seen a, a mainstream politician in the media bringing up this thing. And if she thinks she'll be crushed, she won't mention it again. You know, they were ridiculing her. Oh, it's just an accounting error. That's the meme. That's the myth they spewed up. And the powers that be don't have to do shit. They have all these useful idiots doing it for them. It's like the prisoners trying to gang up on and bash a fellow prisoner who says, hey, I think there's a way out over there. <laughs> I think uh, the emperor has no clothes. Oh, let's get them, right? We are keeping ourselves in the prison. Well, actually, the public, the masses are keeping themselves in the prison. And you, who are a pirate, and me, who also are a rebel, we are obliged to try. And we shouldn't, like I said, there's no left wing, there's no right wing. We're obliged to try to pool in every, any way we can and so that's what you got going let's say in Spain uh, they have uh, an interesting populist movement who taking the consequences of this they're not right they're not left they're just taking issues that both leftists and rightists if you identify with one of them but are genuine who are from the people meaning populist are concerned about and at the end of the day there's more things in common of the real matters. Yes, yes, all these identity political matters are different. That's true. But that's bullshit things anyway. I don't care. I wouldn't even vote if it was about gender discussion or abortion or all that because it doesn't concern me. What does concern me is everything to do with the structures in this system, this very, very corrupt system. And my last part of this run, you talked about, you know, how everybody is fed up of political correctness, right? And, and, and that's true. But we've been that for, what, 20 years now? It's been politically correct to be politically incorrect for about 20 years. Just like I'm fed up of political correctness, I'm also fed up with political incorrectness in that I'm not saying you can't be honest, crude or anything, but, you know, the intentional trolling. You know, trying to, it's like Satanists, right? Satanists think they are free. They think they're in opposition to Christianity. They're not. They're still a slave of the same premise. You wouldn't have Satanists if it wasn't for Christianity. You have to have a, a norm that you're going to oppose, right? And so it becomes with political incorrectness too. Oh, we can't do this. We can't say that. Then I'm going to do it, okay? But then you're still controlled by the same premise. That's why I'm going a third way. So I'm saying I'm fed up with political correctness. I'm fed up with political incorrectness. And that's why in my shows, I'm trying to just have a genuine, goddamn genuine conversation, man. And if that means to be a, a gentleman when that's uh, the right thing to do, I do that. If that's to be a swearing rebel or, or bashing something, if that's natural to do, I do that. You see what I mean? I don't, it's like when the mic is off, how do you interact with people? That's what we should try to bring to the table. Not to try, because most of these internet trolls, 
they are just like the political correct people. They're just as hypocritic because when they turn off the mic, they're not these b b rough bullies that they pretend to be. They're usually dipshits. So uh, why not just bring who you are to the table and be who you goddamn are? And when you interact with someone, why not just interact as you would have done anyway? That's what I try to do. That's what I believe you and me are doing now. And we're not being ruled by invisible premises of correctness or incorrectness, right? So, um, yeah, I guess uh, I guess I should just give you back the road <laughs> at this point. But you get the gist of what I'm saying, right? There's a third way every, anywhere. There's a third way. You don't have to play up, uh, follow the playbook in either of them. That's right. The false dilemma, as it's known in classical uh, logic, one of the most basic uh, elemental, elementary uh, logical fallacies there, there is out there, black and white thinking, either or. Exactly. Uh -huh. And you're, you're uh, right on the mark, I think, as well, too, when you uh, try to emphasize or drive the point home. No, let, let me corroborate it mm -hmm. further. If you if you may indulge me a couple of moments. Sure. Yeah, you're the guest. The floor is yours. I'm going to illustrate how this really has consequences because it's not just about uh, social interacting or even political interacting. It goes to everything. You may mention Corey Gould. Well, that's an excellent example of the, the false dichotomy. The, people don't realize this, and that's because people are dumbed down and there's no real education out there. But here's the thing. Say you have a classified space program. And say you've had it since the 50s, as the evidence points to. And say JFK was clued in on this, and that's why he said, no more bullshit. You have one way out. You go to the moon within 10 years from now and let people know we can do this. Okay, so they kill him, but the program is still there. Now, what will we do with this program? We can't just kill this program now that we got rid of JFK. Well, let's, let's uh, you know, our Nazis who are working for us, allegedly, but that's another story. Uh, come up with some bullshit, some some uh, dog and pony show for the masses. Okay, and so we do that. And then you have, let's say that's just, you don't have to buy into what I'm saying, although it's evidence for everything if you look into it. But let's just say as a hypothetic, that's what's going on. So what would the powers that be do to handle this thing? Uh, well, it's pretty simple. First, you have the n naive people who believes everything they're told, right? So, yeah, yeah, Apollo went to the moon just as it said and everything is uh, nice and shiny. Okay. Then you have those who start poking and, and deconstructing it and, oh, it's all a scam. And they don't believe anything. So they think, no, we n never went to the moon. You know that meme. So here you have a perfect false dichotomy. You have those people who reject that it happened and you have those people who believed everything as they're told. That's how they've been ruling this world since the Second World War. And then the truth is lost in between. That, in this case, will be that, okay, we have a white space program, which is more or less bullshit. Sure, we've sent up some rockets, fuel-based rockets, as if that's how they... But we really... I'm, I'm not saying Obama on Mars, but I'm saying they can do much more than, than we imagine. And if you want the details, check my program with Michael Schrack called This is the Classified Space Program. It will be out on YouTube around the spring. I'll give you another example of how they can handle this. Let's say, uh, let's take ancient aliens. So you have those people who believe the idiot version that, you know, we pulled ourselves out of the Stone Age bootstraps, uh, I don't know, 20,000 years ago or something, and, or 10,000 years ago, and uh, started to grow a civilization 5,000 years ago, etc. That's the mainstream bullshit story that doesn't hold up to any scrutiny and investigation. And then you have those people who think, oh, look at all these anomalies, all these mysteries. It has to be the gods. It has to be aliens. It's monsters from outer space, of course. Now, let's say the truth is man has been on this globe for millions of years. Let's say we've had rise and fall in many civilizations. Then cover up the antediluvian civilization with the ancient aliens thing. And then you cater to both. You cater to those who believe everything they're told, and you cater to those who don't believe and buy into the first cover story they get. 
It's the same thing they do with the classified space program, right? They, they're putting Corey Goods people there to deflect from. And I'm not saying there's no such thing as aliens. I'm not saying there wasn't ancient astronauts. I'm just saying people can't know that we've been advanced on Earth for, you know, at least since the last ice age, maybe millions of years, according to Cremo's evidence. So deflect, put up a false dichotomy, get both factions of people misled, and status quo can continue. And if you really want to go down the deep end, you can argue that the same, that flat earth is a distraction from hollow earth. You can argue that there's a many, you can argue that creationism, Mandela effect. Let's not forget the Mandela effect. Well, uh, you tell me how that plays into the false dichotomy. But I, I also say that maybe even uh, intelli- uh, maybe creationism is a distraction from intelligent design. So you you always have you know you have these two officially approved versions, and you wouldn't think it, but the officials approve one rebel version to put in all the opposition. And so you can't get to the truth. And that's what's going on when you buy into the wing thing. Like the old Indian saying, remember that both wings belong to the same bird. But if you have both feet fighting each other, right, we're not going anywhere. So if people just could forget about these labels and see issues, what do you really care about? What do you really think about? Nobody really votes, for instance, based upon how much you swear or not. Political correctness is a part of the identity politics bullshit. They flaunt issues like that. That's what they try to take Trump on. They take him on things that doesn't hurt him. Oh, he said, grab him by the pussy. People don't give a shit. People give a shit if they can get a roof over their head, bread in their belly. Bread is actually not healthy, but you get my gist. Uh, So that's what they try to take him on, nail him on political incorrect stuff. And that actually helps his numbers, by the way. But they don't take him on. Why are you rimming the asses of Israel and Saudi Arabia? Why are you saying that you're going to be hard on the Muslims? And then you ban all the innocent Muslim countries. And then you align with those bastards who are actually doing all this shit. This is the crazy world we live in. No wonder people are confused, paranoid, and don't give a damn, and whatever, right? Because it's damn hard to steer. But there are some sound principles. If you master those principles, you can kind of maneuver a little easier in this maze we're trapped in. And as a Gnostic, I think that's our... Gnostic, I I use that as as a spiritual rebel. That's our obligation. That's how we should move about. We should try to use what's called a trivium, quadrivium, Google it. And if you have a few tools, it's easier to to maneuver. So I don't care. I I don't care about what people identify as. I always try to find out what's behind this false label, this mask, this this, uh, flag post. What are your flag actually commemorating? And if it's a good thing, I'm on board. If it's not, bye-bye. Host of... Forum Borealis, Norway's Al Borealis, a rather enigmatic, and as he has just made clear to the listening audience, very much Gnostic type individual, dropping by, joining us here again for the second time in the past, well, you do the math, folks. It's been about five or six months, I guess, March uh, was the last time that he joined us here on the Robin Hood, so... Uh, uh, this is episode number 132 of Pirate Radio Podcast. Thanks, everybody, for dropping by. It is a pre-recorded affair that we had to approach this way simply because of time scheduling issues, and that's about the gist of it. We had intended to uh, and had talked about doing it live, but Maybe the third time round we'll find uh, things more copacetic and in line. They say third time's a charm. It's proven itself to be that way here over the balance of uh, what we've put together since we launched this project, Pirate Radio Podcast, just a couple of years ago. You've really covered a lot of ground, though. I tell you, I was actually just uh, madly scribbling down, or I should say typing out as many just kind of brief notes as I could to keep us on point, basically, but uh, you've really unpacked a lot here. You know why? Because by now I realized I'm spoiled. 
you know we do three hour shows for breakfast, right, in, in the forum. So when I'm invited on as guest on other shows, just when I feel we're settling in, that's why, oh, we have to take a break or just when the flow is rolling, oh, and thank you for today, <laughs> right? So I just figured, shit, I, we have to go deep now because we've been tangoing around a lot of pointers here and there, but we should also give them some substance. So that's why I wanted to uh, elaborate a little on this point because we've been touching it from so many angles, right? You mentioned a lot of stuff that I, I felt all went back to this basic principle. And I, I'm on a mission, I'm on a crusade to get that message out because many of my guests know about this. I, I often pick guests who are aware of the false dichotomy and, and try to bash through. That's why Catherine Fitz, who identifies, I guess, as a classical conservative, not retarded conservative, like so-called Christian right or whatever, but a genuine, uh, and that's fair enough, it's her values and, and she can uh, do whatever she wants, but she's a no-nonsense person, she's a real person. And that's why she didn't have any qualms with backing up Ocasio-Cortez, who's so-called progressive in the populism sense of the term. Because that's what we need to do. If we can't agree upon facts, we'll never get this ship, uh, this not the Robin Hood, but Gaia moving in the right direction. We, we, we're going to be prisoners forever. And I don't know about you, man, but my short time on Earth is going to be devoted to better it. Well, the word uh, and term gnosis does mean knowledge, of course. So, um, yeah, but that's not even a, that, even that's a bad translation. It, it because in English, knowledge is like an intellectual kind of information thing, right? But the real meaning of the word uh, gnosis is knowing. In, in, in we have a perfect word in, in Norwegian called erkännelse. I think in German is erkentnung. But in English, you don't have a equivalent realization, maybe. But it's a deeper. It's 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 something you know. Not something you read. Say that again, just slowly again. One more time, in Norwegian than the German. Erkännelse in Norwegian, and I think erkentnung or something like that in German. You know, it's interesting. In Korean, it's the as asumnida, is the, the understanding, asoyo, oh, asumnida. Wow. So, asumnida. Mm. you know, I actually just sent uh, Graham Hancock something the other day dealing with his, uh, off of his Twitter feed, and uh, still waiting for him to get back to us. <laughs> Likely, who knows if that's ever going to happen, but it doesn't matter because what I uh, shared with him had to do with how that there's a large proportion, a percentage of the world's doormen are actually here on the Korean peninsula, about 40%, I guess. Of the world's what, what now? Dolmen, the uh, giant rocks for, that are used in, for burial markers. Oh, oh okay. The stones, right. the kind of like uh, not really megaliths. What is the? You remember uh, who's it? Uh, Asterix and uh, yeah, is it Asterix Bo and uh, Obelix? Bo we call it Bota Stone. I don't know. If that Me, or, like. How about Men here? Men here? Menhir? Menhir? I don't know no, how you say it. I know Asterix and Obelix. And how do you say it in Norwegian? Those stones. Bota Stein. Stein is stone. Stein. Yeah. How about that? Well, and you know it's interesting because in Korean. It's at the in the West they're known as dolmen. In Korean, go in dol. Those two yeah, words. Yeah, but I dol. don't think Korean is related so much to the Latin alphabet. I think it's related to Turkish and by extension also Finnish, Hungarian, Lap, um, right. Estonian. What I'm, what I'm trying to say here, though, just to just kind of draw your attention, is how those are those words are exactly the same. There's other examples wow. as well, too. Okay. Uh, well, go in in the West, they're known as dolmen, and in dol Korean, go in dol. There's a dol showing wow. up again. Yeah. That and must that, be, you know what? That must be a frag antediluvian fragment. Right. Exactly. Same thing as here. Check this out. Sanskrit, English, and Korean go ga ga. And in Korean, it's ga, and in Sanskrit, it's ga. Don't say <laughs> go, ga, go it's go. So, go, ga, ga. Wow. There's other examples, yeah, too. Yeah, that's, that's there's also other examples a too. from the. You know, I think it's, what's his face? Uh, Klaus Dona. You know Klaus Dona? Uh, and what's the last name? Dona. He's an Austrian, Aust uh, I say. Uh, Austrian? 
a chap from Austria. Yeah. How do you say uh, someone from Austria? Austrian. <laughs> Austrian. Austrian. That's it. There you go. Sorry, Austrians. Uh, so he has some interesting research because he was, was just a mainstream artifact, uh, you know, high-end uh, artifact dealer. And he started collector. He started to realize, geez, all these ancient, ancient, because that's what's his, his uh, passion, uh, the old stuff, really old stuff. And he realized no matter where they are from in the world, they have stuff in common. He tried to decode it and he realized because officially uh, Sanskrit, is the oldest surviving language on earth. There's one other from that area too. What's it called? Um, p- 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 oh, I forget. From India? Oh, there's two. Yeah, I think the other one also maybe, at least from that area. But anyway, there's two very old uh, languages and, and they're quarreling which one is the oldest. But here's the thing. When he uh, analyzes these, this symbolism and these uh, glyphs and whatever, it's a so-called proto-Sanskrit, meaning it's older than Sanskrit, and it's been used all over the world. It's the same kind of symbols and artifacts and archetypes, and that means we had a global civilization. Unlike today, when it's English, you probably have to communicate. You, you, yeah, you have your local language probably, but you also need some kind of uh, common speak, common tongue, right? And so that's probably it. And then you know it's you're dealing with old stuff when you're into proto-Sanskrit. So we probably had a global civilization. Doesn't mean sure. we were flying about with crystal engines or whatever, but we did. We were in communication, and uh, evidence points to that. So that's why we can have words popping up today all over the globe. Apparently, not related countries, not even in terms of language. But still, some words would be common. Like the word for Atlantis, you find the root to that word, which is T-L-N. You'll find it in South America, you'll find it in Egypt, you'll find it in India, you'll find it all over the place. Which means it's a survival, a fragment of the of our ancestors. Isn't that something? So, uh, yeah, it's an area of uh, study that definitely interests me and it's one that I am most certainly intrigued by and I'm always happy to uh, when there are people, experts uh, unlike myself, I think this is the way to put it uh, expert by no means, but just you know, people that are, are uh, schooled and uh, you know, skilled and quite knowledgeable in these areas that uh, you know, worthwhile listening to them via podcast or documentary type uh, affair or what have you. So you know, linguistics and etymological studies, you know, absolutely that's some pretty uh, some pretty fascinating uh, territory and terrain, most definitely. So uh, we can come back to this in, at any point as well, too, as well as any number of different points that we hit on here. But before we wrap up, we've only got uh, around another, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or so. And I know you're just making the point not just a few minutes ago, uh, not so far back, how these shows just seem to fly by just as you're trying to get settled in. They uh, are suddenly over, but... Uh, so just talking points that uh, have come up here along the way that you mentioned, including liberal arts, uh, but also minds.com. Let's not forget. And, uh, I was going to bring something up because you had talked about Trump with respect to how recently we didn't bring this up during the course of today's, uh, world pirate radio, uh, newscast show segment. I think it was, uh, number 36 that we streamed out here today, not to get dates confused, but uh, I'm, I'm speaking now in the sense of what we did on this past, I should say, Wednesday. But uh, Donald Trump, a bit of a, a chess uh, player and, and protege, uh, along with his young son, 11-year-old Baron, if you can believe that, has recently, now I wish I had the actual article on hand, but just 
off the top of my head, was recently granted his master's or grandmaster status. I actually think he's the only intelligent offspring. Well, maybe Ivanka is socially intelligent, but I think he's a savant. I think he's a Asperger or autist. That's what some people have, have discussed or it's been talked about in the media. It goes a long way to explain why his parents are caring about that issue of all the issues. Oh, yeah, sure, and sensitive. And they try to make him out to be as if, uh, I don't know what it is. Here's There's the dichotomy, I guess, uh, in the one hand, the media trying to portray Trump as, they would go so far as, as, as even to make him out to be somebody who's stupid, which he's clearly not, he might uh, even criticize him on other grounds. But... Uh, what is intelligence? He's, he's, he's savvy when uh-huh. it comes to business, and he's, he's very good at, I guess you could call it conning, and he plays the media like a violin. So on the, those terms, he's intelligent. If you dr- parachute him off into the jungle, he'll probably last for two days. There he won't be very intelligent. So what's intelligence, right? The, he, that's a misnomer. If you ask me. Yeah, he wouldn't be too well coached. Well, I would to be clueless in, in some settings. Go ahead. Well, you and me, you and me, right? We we uh, on we feel comfortable on air because we have the experience and we've learned the trade the hard way. But in other settings, we're clueless. So it all depends what you're talking about. And I'm pretty sure if you drop Baron Trump off to a party, he'll be the last chap in his class to walk away with the girls. Well, maybe not because he's loaded <laughs> with money. But you know what I mean? I don't think he has social skills, but I can believe he would make a master thesis before breakfast. Yeah, sure. So it'll be interesting to keep an eye on on him. And I, I feel sorry for him, actually. Uh, you know, just watching, kind of observing from a distance that you know, and the way that certain people in media have, not lately, but initially, they came out attacking the poor kid or making just really insensitive, uh, dismissive, mean-spirited comments, really, because they didn't like his father. So they thought, they'd well, let's, let's attack mm. the kid then, I guess. He's an easy target. You know, it's like, Jesus. What, yeah, what Marie you... Antoinette had the same problem. Uh, Joy Behar from The View, I think she made one, maybe it was her, or Rosie O'Donnell, one of those types, and there's been a few others. Yeah, but who cares yeah. what those hands are cockling about? You don't just use your remote. Uh, we should also ban them in terms of putting the agenda. It's a complete illusion, all that stuff. They had their field day in the, I guess, up until the 2000s, and now they're... You're talking about the death of the legacy media, dinosaur media. Let the English fleets... I'm I'm sure your partner in crime, what's his face, Long John something, I'm sure he would agree that we should let the English fleet sink in peace. Captain Long John Sinclair, that's right. Uh, I've been here the whole time listening in, so... You're there? Oh, I I thought you weren't there today. Well, that's it. You you call me up. You want to get in touch. It's great you reference me. So you are me, Hardy. It's fabulous to have you on board once again. Thank you, Captain. Hey, I have a question for you. Yeah, fire away. Have you kept an eye out? I guess the only working eye you have. Have you kept it uh, up and seen what's going on on Oak Island? I'm sure you've been there. Well, to tell you something, and I'm not sure if we discussed this the last time you are on board. You are right, though. Captain Kidd was there, you know? Well, Captain Kidd may have possibly some speculation <laughs> that, uh, that that could be a bit of a stretch. But Oak Island, indeed, the missing Templar fleet, some talk of the uh, connections to uh, that part of the world. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm really one to speak at this particular moment, uh, talking out of school. Too bad, I hope. Uh, maybe letting a little too much... Uh, cat out of the bag, as it were. Don't want no, to let too true. much slip. Find myself in the hemp and news. That's true. We have to keep a tongue in check. I'm not sure if I really uh, follow what he's getting at exactly, but Oak Island, indeed, uh, definitely a, a place well worth revisiting. I'm not sure. Did that come up over the course of our first conversation? Not sure we did touch up on it too much, though it's worth it. I'm going to have more shows about it uh, in 2019. It's really great stuff. I'm not convinced, but I'm inclined to think that's where the menorah and the Ark of the Covenant, or at least one of the Arks, is hidden. And they're really getting close to cracking it now. 
I've been following that story unfold for so long, and it's really cool stuff. There's something really strange going on, isn't there? Because it's just, it's quite out of the ordinary what they found to this point. I have not uh, tuned in uh, or really kept a close watch on things as far as this reality TV show is concerned, which now I think is, who knows what season it is in, but I, I think I'm speaking uh, of, uh, well, the captain I know, uh, I was, he's got the one eye that's patched and the other one I'm sure is quite jaded. Yeah, uh, that's on the rally TV. It was a jaded eye. That's yeah, yeah. They're, they're milking it for all it's worth. But I tell you what, next time I come on, we'll know more about that stuff, and or, mem- or when you come on my show, so we'll we'll discuss that there, and we'll just follow your talking points now, because I know you have stuff you want to air, and we don't have that much time. So yeah, the biggest. Uh issue surrounding Oak Island, that whole angle, part of the world, and and period in, in history, well, two things. One is the missing Templar fleet, and second is how just today, or I should say maybe this past Wednesday, during our uh, weekly World Pirate Radio News segment, we kind of discussed and brought up, uh, drew to listeners' attention, how it's now approximately the 300th year anniversary of the death of uh, Blackbeard, really, which I think in many ways marked the end of the so-called uh, golden age of piracy, as it was known. The brethren of the, uh, I-, I guess that was the brethren of the coast. I'm not sure if I'm thinking, I'm getting them mixed up with the Barbary coast. I should know my pirate facts and lore a little better. I feel a little kind of... Uh, you know, people think that's a trivial thing due to Disney, but you know what? The piracy stuff is, I, I think I mentioned last time I was on, it's an incredibly interesting story. Uh, it's, and it is connected to the Templars. In fact, I think the first pirates were Templars. And of course, the Jolly Roger, the Jolly Roger is identical to what they use in, in Freemasonic lodges today because it's a remnant from that. Uh, the, the piracy thing ties into so much interesting stuff. Uh, the roots of anarchism, uh, uh, political things, mystery things, all sorts of stuff. You really have uh, an expert on for that. Uh, in fact, I think, uh, yeah, I'll just make, uh, what should they say, an uh, d- executive uh, decision right now. I- on the forum, we're going to have on someone who can give us uh, the true and deep and interesting story of piracy. Sounds good to me. You should also try to maybe send them our way in the new year, 2019, sure. if you can. You know, believe it or not, we're pretty much almost all booked up for, well, the first four or five months really at this point already. If you can, I can believe that. I have a list of yeah. 40 people. And I don't see how I can get around to them. Oh, I know. A lot of people who've never done this sort of thing don't understand the amount of work and effort it really does yeah. take to put things together. And that's why we so much do value the support that we pick up over on Patreon, forward slash WPRPN, uh, as well as, of course, the PayPal donations and Minds.com, the, the, the tokens that we have uh, sent to us there. So half of everything of which does, according to our Robin Hood mandate, go directly back to charitable causes. That's great. Uh, you know, uh, lead by example, they say. So we'll see how many times I swear in this show, and I'll PayPal you that. And I hope others will do too. Sure. Yeah, we give you the one freebie there, the one pass, and then, of course, it's the... It's the one occasion where we're expecting that you'll... Hey, if you're, if you're listening to this, if you're a devoted f- forum listener, I encourage you to contribute to uh, your PayPal or Patreon uh, at the same amount as I've been swearing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, to pledge and to challenge. See, that's two yeah. of the things that we've worked into the uh, Operation Secret Santa. It's all about what goes around comes around, right? So Yeah, and kind of, well, and then we... Improve your karma. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the word karma just simply means action simple Sanskrit there. So, you know, a lot of times people, they want to take quite a while to unpack the term, what it means. I ask people and they just go on forever trying to explain it, but it's just one word, folks, action and uh, real simple. So, and that, you know, I think could be considered what occurs and where your intent is when it comes to actions, of course, our speech 
and ultimately our thoughts, although that's a kind of more subtle area that really takes up a lot of work as far as uh, maybe like expert level, highly accomplished yeah. yoga, one might even say on a, on a mental. Karma yoga is, is all about doing uh, improvement of the Service world. to others, service to others. And, and you can say improve your dharma if <laughs> karma isn't good enough, dharma. Or Dhamma, as it's called in Pali. Pali is that other language I was talking about. Sanskrit right. and Pali. There you go. That's right. You know, and, and Dharma, it's interesting too, because there are so many different definitions, apparently, of, it's a tricky word. There's, there's like 20, 30 different yeah, definitions. But that goes for all essential words. Let's say if, if, if someone asks you, do you believe in God? If someone asks me that, first off, I, I, I tend not to believe in stuff. I want to know, right? But uh, let alone that, put that aside. Before we can even discuss such a thing, let's agree upon what God is. What what the use does that mean? So, um, you know, if we're going to do that, we can sit here from now until the next ice age, right? Because <laughs> what does it mean? What do you project into words? That's what it boils down to. You can't really have a real conversation about anything uh, until you agree upon the premises. That's the problem. People don't agree upon the premises. People walk around with their own notions in their head, believing everybody else shares those notions. And we don't. If we were telepathic, it would be much easier. But we're not. We are chained to words, and we're chained to what little aspects, what little glimmer of this reality we've realized. And then we go around assuming that's what everybody else shares. You know, we have a saying, I don't know if it translates to English, maybe you have the same saying, but it's like to know someone on yourself. That's an old saying. You 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 can't know someone on yourself, but most people go around doing that. They, instead of knowing themselves, they project what they have in them and think that's how other people uh, read the world. How about this one, Verstehen? That sounds German to me. It is, yes, and it's from, I guess it was a term that the German sociologist Max Weber, uh, I don't know if he coined necessarily, it's just he drew upon it from out of the German language and used it as part of a central part of his, uh, you know, sociological worldview. But so what for, was the word again? Oh, ver, Verstehen, or ver, Swedish I think is Verstor. Verstor, oh, Verstehen. Yeah, we have that. Verstor, Verstor. Yes, and yes. Do you know what Ver, that means? Verstanden, Verstanden, yes. yes let's that's see if we're deeper... on the same page. Pardon? Go ahead, let's see if we're on the same page here or not. No, no, it's the same word. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. We call it Verstor. It's uh, some kind of understanding. Yes. I'll take it from here for now, at least, it's just to let the listeners in on things if they're kind of scratching their heads wondering what is we're going on about exactly. But, yeah, understanding as far as seeing things from another person's point of view, quite simply. So, to verstehen, verstor, verstehen, in the German sense, at least my understanding, the way I was told, is that uh, you take on the other's perspective or point of view. And, you know, it's interesting because the old classic, it's been attributed, I believe, to Aristotle. Don't know how true this is or not, but they say that it is the mark of an educated man to be able to entertain an idea without necessarily, you know, believing it or subscribing to the whole notion. Exactly. That's the whole, whole intention with my shows. It is to entertain uh, scenarios that are new to us. That's why we, we have a, one of our buzzwords are paradigm expansion. If you're going to bury yourself down into into that sewer hole you're trapped in, you'll never get anywhere. But if you stretch your head up above and try to see the stars, then sure, sure you'll stumble and fall a few times. But if you can't do an intellectual exercise, there's no hope for you. And I'm not talking even about, you know, this snobbish uh, concept of education. I'm talking about moving yourself forward, growing into becoming a god. Now, let's go back to understanding, because uh, in English, it's standing under. Uh, I'm not so fan of that word. In German and in Norwegian, forstor means to stand in front. That's a better etymology there, because that's more real. It's like you're uh, ahead with your standing. You're not under. Uh, but you had some talking points you wanted to go through. Let, let's do that. Yeah, we are closing in on the uh, 
final few minutes of this week's feature conversation with return guest, host of Forum Borealis, the ever enigmatic and uh, wanderlust-filled Al Borealis, based out of, let's try not to mangle it again too badly, Svalbard, Norway. So, Svalbard. how was that? Svalbard. Svalbard. Get it, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. a basic yeah, kind of it. approach there. Svalbard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it's a really, uh, you know, big kick and a thrill for me personally because the level I kind of connected with you was in my mind thinking, you know, there's a guy, unlike a lot of these other ding dongs out there in social media who are so high on themselves, you know, cause your channel, <laughs> you almost had to pay yourself there. Yeah. yeah. Well, your, your channel, your channel's got, you know, you got some good, d- d- decent uh, following there, and you haven't really even done much, it seems, no iTunes, and you haven't really, you talk to Tommy Shutter, he might get you rocking and rolling a little more premium, kind of uh, pave the way a little further for you here, if you're so inclined, but we'll save that just maybe for off air here uh, a little later on down the road, but, you know, I was really quite yeah. Please, the initial conversation we had, the fact he took me up on the first offer, of course, to do the interview that we did, got that uh, in the can. And as it turned out, with the timing of things, you hadn't done too many interviews up to that point. And uh, even more so, just, uh, you know, this is going back to March now, but uh, at that point, you even agreed to uh, join us here now in December to talk a little bit about Operation Secret Santa as well as whatever else was new in your life. So we very much appreciate you uh, doing that. And uh, the captain could not think any more highly of you. Oh, that's that's an honor. Well, that's just off it. Hell, fellow, well, Matt, it's as a soft, <laughs> I often like to put it there. So. As long as I don't have to be a, a, a deck boy or on your ship, uh... <laughs> oh, the cabin boy position, yeah, you got to watch out. It's cabin a little boy. kind of, uh, it's a little dicey there yeah, from uh, yeah, time to. But hey, you know that actually, pirates. There, there was gay marriage back in the day. Apparently, that was accepted by the sailors. Although, oh yeah, they di- they didn't care about identity issues at all, at all. In fact, if something was contrary to the norm, they'd be all for it. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, classic liberal tradition is kind of how I see it until you find yourself in the heat of battle and then you better listen. You were kind of obligated. Your dharma was to fall in line with the captain's orders, basically, and working together as a well-oiled you know, machine. Basically. Obviously. And if not, uh, then it means they don't have respect for the captain and they better replace him. That's mutiny, there right? And then um, but we elect a better captain. You know, you asked me about the Vikings show. Well, one TV program that I did take in up to, I think we watched the first couple seasons with the wife here. And we, uh, you know, the Korean wife, it's difficult sometimes connecting, of course, even after 16 years of marriage, if you can believe that. But, uh, you know, one of the wow. things, uh, oh, it's, it's a challenge, but it's, it's rewarding too. I mean, believe me, there's, there are rewards. So your wife, your wife is a Canadian? No, no, she's Korean. I'm, I'm the, yeah, I'm that's the Canadian. What I she's the Korean. So you've been in Korea for that long? 16 tours of duty. Wow. My man, yeah, Respect. that's right. So, you betcha. Uh, you uh, know what? But I may look you up uh, when I'm uh, over there uh, eventually. You better. I'll be pretty pissed off, yeah. So, sure. Cool. We might have to come and hunt you down, actually, and <laughs> take care of business. I don't know. It, it, it seemed a little grim at some point, you know, North Korea oh, program. Man, all I'm waiting for, dude. Just I, all I'm waiting for now is the end of fucking pot prohibition, which they fucking they brought in. Oh geez, there's I'm now I'm gonna have to pay the potty mouth mm-hmm. jar. I just dumped mm-hmm. a couple f bombs. <laughs> I don't know what we'll do about those in the post production end of things. But anyways, uh, yeah, pot prohibition, which was only brought in in 1976. So just we're waiting for that right now. Myself, along with a few others here, I'd imagine too. And you know, in the north, it, there's no crime when it comes to weed. I'm not sure if I brought this up with you last time. Yeah. You, you, you told me that last time. It, it was great. Uh, blow, blew my mind. But you've been mentioning Vikings, and I just want to say, you know the Norwegian reaction to that show? Uh, is it kind of cynical? 
No, it's uh, more in line with how our contemporary culture is. It's more satirical. Uh, it was so hilarious because it, it portrays the image people have of our past. So we put up our own show based upon Vikings, but it's a comedy show. It's called oh, North Satire. Man. It's a satire, yes, and it's based upon Vikings. Uh, I encourage everyone with a sense of humor to check it out. That's a Norwegian production with Norwegian actors. It's called Norsemen. Uh, there's two seasons at least, but I think only one is in English. They made they made it in, in both in English and in Norwegian. But you can see season two with English subtitles. Anyway. There you go. That was my next the follow-up question. Yeah. So, And just to be clear, so we don't get too carried along here and I don't uh, just – uh, let people in on what it was I was getting at earlier there with the wife and I. It's Black Sails was the, right. the name of the series that I encourage everyone to check out. Really well done and uh, well worth spending a little bit of uh, time watching and and hopefully you know enjoying and maybe even learning a little bit. Uh, it's really impressive the way that they brought things together. And uh, in a historic, I know I was, you know, railing a little bit earlier about historical reenactments and the way a lot of people, they're not in their own minds able to make the distinction between history and, and reality and, and the way Hollywood version, especially in the name that constantly for me comes to mind is Steven Spielberg. I mean, I'm just you know, one name, one movie title in particular we could say Schindler's List, but we won't save that for another time. Amistad. Amistad, right, right, right. Yeah, Amistad. Yeah. Amistad, which was, uh, that was, it depicted the nonsense. I'm not even going to go there right now. Just leave it there. Maybe people can figure out why I'm bringing that name up with the transatlantic slave trade and who was involved. And the, believe me, the real perpetrators, many of them were Same never today. even discussed. Same not today. a single Nothing time was changed. mentioned. I don't know if you know who I'm getting at exactly, but we're just going to leave it at that. Sometimes I throw the names out there. This time around, I'm not even going to bother. Just kind of go with the flow and and uh, steer ourselves along the way here elsewhere. You know, it doesn't take much for uh, people to have their channels banned ultimately from YouTube. So oh, yeah. in we some should, ways, we should have talked about know. that today. Yes. Uh, man, dude, hey. We're we're not really self censoring in a big way. Believe me, if you check out some of our new shows. Hey, let's discuss that when you come on my show then. Oh boy, put me in the hot seat, huh? Yeah, no, but we have to bring attention to. You it. might have to hold my feet to the fire, and I'll just I'll share with you my views. And if someone f- takes a different perspective or way of looking at things, then they can hold me to it. And uh, you know, I'm I'm open to changing my my position on things. But from my understanding here, with respect to the transatlantic slave trade, the truth of the matter has not been told. And many of the history same was with hemp. You know, I researched that during university. It's like what the what the f? I, I don't want to lose ten more dollars. So. What the, it does go towards a good cause, of course, too. So maybe I should just be a, you know, <laughs> profanity, uh, laced, potty mouthed, uh, pirate, but maybe then again, not today. So, but hemp, uh, you know, and the way it was surgically, uh, just clear across the board, to, written, written right out of history. I went back and was researching all these areas, like, what the hell's going on? Why are they not talking about it? Finding out, well, geez, it's, it, it was a, it was a, a central item and staple, but there's so little mention. It's, it's just yeah. they, incredible. So there you go, like total memory hole in the classic Orwellian sense of the word. Yeah. But I tell you. Amen to that. Yeah, you know, we've pretty much, uh, once again, just run the course here, reached the end of the road, so, and you've done a yeoman service, of course, I know you've been out on the road, and uh, hopefully over the over the duration of our exchange and conversation here, maybe manage to perk up your, your energy level a little bit, hopefully, <laughs> but... Uh, Between that and the coffee, it's getting better, yeah. Yeah, there's hardly a, a show that I do without a coffee or tea not on hand along yeah, with yeah, – uh, I'm not that straight edge. I, I do consume coffee. But uh, alcohol, you know, talking about uh, intoxications, uh, you have this list of what's the most damaging uh, toxic and what's the least damaging. Now, Mariana isn't on the bottom of that list uh, in, in terms of what's the least damaging. Uh, actually, you would think it was, but it isn't. Uh, but at the top, uh, you find uh, two things. You find heroin and you find alcohol. 
And tobacco, I'm so, surely got to be up there too. Yeah, tobacco is somewhere in the middle. Um, but you know what's the least damaging uh, toxic? Chocolate. <laughs> no, uh, they, they're just listing like I, I don't know the English term, but things you get uh, alter your consciousness from um, that kind of drug. Magic mushrooms. Exactly. Magic mushrooms is at the bottom for some weird reason. Um, but it's true. I mean, um, it, it can't hurt you. Yeah, yeah it can be. Well, you know, but it can also flush out your demons, of course. I, uh, speaking from experience, and I will go on the record stating this, that uh, would much more recommend anyone out there dosing themselves with mushrooms than uh, than acid, LSD. Uh, yeah. The mushrooms for me a far more organic and earthy experience where I was able to fully connect with this planet, the Gaia, as you referenced to uh, you know, for at the start of our conversation here this week, it really helped to plug me in to what was basically going on here on this planet as far as vibration and just the pulsation of things and what it meant, I guess, in some ways to be alive and, and here in this form as a human. I'm not sure what other way to really put things, but, you, you know... <laughs> Yeah, hopefully people get the essence. So, what was your uh, just to, just you know in a in in brief or summary uh, yourself have ever uh, mm -hmm. tried mushrooms? Had that opportunity? I have, I have, uh, because it grows all over our country. Uh, I mean, cannabis isn't a natural plant here, but uh, mushrooms are, and I believe also the ancient Vikings used different kinds of mushrooms when they went berserk. M moksha, <laughs> familiar with That's moksha? Where it comes from. Um, heard Huxley, the term. Huxley wrote reminded. about it, but also the ancient Aryans would use it as part of their Vedic rites. You know, there was uh, oh, their, right. their, uh, yeah. their religious ceremonies and so forth. And it, it was all about consciousness alteration and maybe communion with right. God, if that's the word that you want to use or term. Just the one. What's it all about, man? Yep. What's it all about? The one song or, or as uh, the one song or as they say in Latin, universe. Uh -huh. There you go. So, uh, my friend and, and fellow pirate matey, Mr. Al Borealis, host and I guess CEO, founder of uh, Form Borealis, uh, let's uh, hear your website addresses, all your contact information, and uh, email, all that other kind of good stuff, if you would be so kind. Yeah, I'm uh, just going to tell my uh, second in command to set sails again uh, towards the north. But, yeah, uh, it's uh, forumborealis.net for the website. You know, I have to uh, use the opportunity to clear something. We get some bashing at YouTube when we market a new show is out for the website because they think we do what every other show does. What does every other show do? Well, they release for a freebie, they release part one, and then they retain part two, or they may retain whole episodes of something, right? And then all the freeloaders, or the poor people, or the cheap people they hate that and i have no problem with that uh when i started my show i wanted it to be a free service i wanted everyone to get access to everything because i hadn't at that point subscribed to anything i <laughs> I, I hardly listened to podcasts and i never donated i didn't imagine in a million years that anyone would donate to us so i set myself and i remember how annoying it was not to get hold of all shows or all parts of the show so i set up this rule that when we recorded this natural conversation we're going to give everything for free to our listeners and i believe that's the best marketing uh, strategy too by the way if you want to get it out there don't make people have to pay so that's what we do that's why bella my assistant bella she always says on air she says all of our files are free and will remain free now on our website we have lots of stuff that you can't get on youtube so how does this these two facts square and I have to say this for the for the bitching and complainers out there. We do share everything, but we have a buffer 
because we realized early on we better have a buffer, otherwise we can't always uh, release stuff. So we have, let's say, the, our goal is to have like five shows unreleased at any given time, but eventually they will get out there. So today we actually have, I think, 10 or 15 shows that aren't on YouTube yet. Now we're like lagging behind it's like when a show comes out it's almost been a year in the pipeline but anyway so i regularly i have to tell my website subscribers that hey we have a new show out right and so i do that on youtube on the community page and then all the youtubers misunderstand they think they won't get this stuff and then they start hating on us for not sharing it but settle down people you'll get everything eventually it's just that we have a buffer and we have to use our outlets to let people know there's something new. So if you donate to us, I don't care, a dollar, that's it. You're on board. We don't sell membership like you have to pay $10 every month, etc. That's bullshit. You donate a dollar to us, preferably more, of course, if you can afford it. But you do that and you get access. And then you get it in real time. As soon as they're out, bang, you get it. So that's how we do this. So it's not really a membership. It's more like, okay, you scratched my back by flushing a dollar in our direction to cover our costs. I scratch your back here. You get it first because you're a devoted listener, right? So it means it means something to you. If you didn't care, you would probably not donate anyway. So that's for you YouTubers out there. You will get it. You just have to be patient. And if, instead of bitching that, hey, that interesting show, why isn't it out yet? Why don't you sign up to become a video maker for us? Because we have to first make a lot of energy, you know this, to make a show in itself. But then, because we're tied up to YouTube and we can't just get, get it out on, on a podcast platform or any other platform, we have to make a following video doesn't have to be like a documentary, of course, it could just be stills, but it still takes time. So if you want us to speed up release productions as far as YouTube goes, you come on in, you make a, a video for us, you'll get half the ad revenue, by the way, and then there's no reason to complain, but of course they don't want to do that, they just want the goods, right? Well then, shut up and be patient. I just had to get it off my chest, sorry. Yeah, well, hey, <laughs> speak your mind, man. So, uh, yeah, the talking stick is yours. And I do once again think that is pretty much it, uh, for this episode, uh, number 132 of Pirate Radio Podcasts with Al Borealis's pre-recorded affair. Hopefully everyone has enjoyed themselves in the chat area. I know we weren't able to work that, uh, live interaction end of things into the equation but hey it was a pleasure yeah and you might even magically pop up in the after show fingers crossed all right then i'll be there uh, my friend thank I'll you try. once again yep. and uh let's uh not forget you've got a subdomain coming to you as well too as a right. as a guest on the show everyone receives a complimentary WPRPN.com subdomain. So as long as you're able to find your way around using WordPress, you can just put an account together and go to town. And finally, I guess really just Operation Secret Santa. Hope to see it out there in some way, maybe even just through email or dropping in where, when you can try to track down as many live streamers, uh, as you can possibly manage, or at least just get the word out and see what sort of feedback and response we get from people. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. It takes typically people, uh, they have to, you know, inquire a little bit to get a clear sense of what's actually going on. There's, uh, there's a lot of moving parts to this whole business. And, uh, the first thing just to say right off the top is it's not your, uh, typical secret Santa, which I'm not sure if yeah. you practice this in Norway or not with the office based gift exchange, people drawing names out of hats, that sort of deal. Well, forget about that. We're completely rebranding, refurbishing, remolding, and, uh, taking back basically a name and a concept, which, Upgrading really is one way of looking at it, as well as expanding too, let's not forget. Getting pretty serious about the whole thing, as well as just doing it in a way which is better than how it's come about to this point through Secret Santa, because, you know, we're giving back to the poor. We're actually trying to do what we can to see that funds are directly rechanneled and redistributed back to the people who are out there and felt 
you know, believed by the donors, Secret Santas, to need it the most. And there's a number of other things that we're hoping to further get along the way here this year as well, including the auction end of the operation as well as the talent and telethon extravaganza. So people, though, if you're interested, send us an email, pirate1radio at gmail.com or pirate1radio at protonmail.com. Don't forget minds.com. I know you've been pretty low profile. I'm going to improve it. Going to improve it. Yeah. Going to flush out shows there. Sure. Well, we're looking forward to that and hoping to see you uh, engage yourself a little more over via the platform. There's a lot that they've got going on for themselves, and there's people that have launched criticisms and the like, but uh, that's to be expected. Uh, I guess I'm in it for the long haul myself. But we'll just see how it all kind of plays out here over the coming uh, uh, months and years, really. So hopefully they don't sell out, but you just never know. Anyways, on that note, thank you once again, and uh, we will catch you on the flip side. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Respect, man. Happy sailing. Looking to lend a little hand this holiday season? Do your part in helping out those in need. You might want to consider getting involved on some level with Operation Secret Santa. Here's a quick overview. Formally kicking off on December 15th, Operation Secret Santa, that's hashtag OSS, is a world grassroots, strictly people-driven, Christmas charity, telethon-styled internet campaign. Referral marketing or what's otherwise known as word of mouth, drives the project's big red sleigh, with all money, donations, and the like going directly to the needy who are selectively sponsored. The four main categories of participants we're looking for include 1. Live streaming web show hosts, speakers, producers, and performers. 2. Operator matchmaking elves making their lists and checking them twice. Three, Secret Santa sponsors. And four, people in any place around the world living in need, worthy of a little Christmas hand up. This year's organizers are presently working on mobilizing and building upon last year's preliminary success with donation levels capped at a suggested price value limit of $1,000. If you have any further questions, be sure to drop by WPRPN.com or check out our groups on both Facebook and Minds.com via a keyword search of simply Operation Secret Santa, hashtag OSS.